Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Bite Size PD. This is Mindfulness in Times of Stress and Uncertainty, Part 2. Appreciate you being here. Um, one kind of initial thought as we start is to think about when I am upset, I typically and kind of fill in fill in the blank. What typically happens when you feel upset? That's going to be something that we're going to address today. All right, I have I am recording. Uh, I wanted to introduce myself. I am Julie Stefan Lindsay. I'm a program evaluation specialist here at ISD, and I just appreciate you being here. Uh, just a reminder of our PD norms. So being committed, being responsible, being respectful, and being safe. If there's one you want to narrow in on today, I'll give you a moment to think about that. And since we're recording and we are not live, these don't apply as much, but you, um, I'll share my email address at the end of the presentation and you're always welcome to email me with any questions or comments or feedback. Um, as part of our MTSS framework, uh, the session today focuses on building a positive school climate. Uh, and in this, in this regard, we are focusing on ourselves today. Uh, we're going to problem solve collaboratively as educators. Uh, what we're focusing on today will help us do that more constructively. And this also falls under PBIS umbrella of self-monitoring. Right, our learning intention for today uh, will be, we're going to explore the connection between mindfulness and emotional agility. And I'm going to guide you in a mindfulness practice uh, that will focus on emotional agility. And our hope is to decrease some stress and increase well being. Uh, the success criteria I would love if you can walk away with um, at least one mindfulness strategy that you can use personally or professionally uh, that helps build your emotional agility. Our norms uh, and learning intention, we've spent about two minutes on that. I'm going to do a quick, quick recap of mindfulness from part one. Uh, you are, of course, welcome to go back and, and watch part one. You don't need to have watched part one, um, but we'll, we'll summarize. And then we're going to talk about mindfulness and emotional agility. Um, I'll share an introduction. I'll talk a little bit about how we practice it, um, why it's important in the workplace, and then um, we'll jump into that guided mindfulness, and then I'll share a few closing thoughts. All right, so a quick recap. In our last session, we talked about mindfulness and stress and kind of what is mindfulness and why do we use it. Um, but the goal of mindfulness is that you're spending time getting to know yourself and getting to know your brain uh, versus trying to control it. So it's a way to relax into uncertainty. So when things are happening around you and you can feel yourself reacting or um, struggling or just kind of trying to figure things out, it's a way to pause and engage in some introspection that then gives us a chance to um, kind of really know what we want to do next or just what we're experiencing. Um, mindfulness will not heal everything. Um, it is not the silver bullet, uh, but it does have many benefits to us physiologically, psychologically, and behaviorally. Um, it's definitely a path toward emotional intelligence, emotional regulation, self-awareness, um, it's a, it's a very calming way to practice those things. So, and when we do it successfully, um, it will increase our resilience, our compassion, um, and support our interpersonal relationships. So we can use it professionally or, or personally. Another quick recap, uh, in the previous session, we talked about perceived stress and the Yerkes-Dodson law. 
uh, which tells us that some level of arousal or stress is good for performance. We kind of get this increase in our attention and interest when something is challenging or um, maybe a little bit stressful. But once we go over that peak and we are too stressed or um, too aroused, then our performance goes down. And that's where we're kind of um, functioning from anxiety or fear, uh, which impairs our performance versus having that optimal amount of stress. So uh, that curve, kind of when you reach that peak of being too stressed, um, depends on the complexity of the task and how familiar you are. So if it's something you do all the time, maybe at first it was stressful, but then it becomes less stressful the more you know, um, or an easy task versus a complex task, you're going to get you might hit that peak sooner with a complex task. Um, so if you want to take the perceived stress scale, uh, this is designed for the workplace. Uh, the link is in the slides and that will give you kind of a sense of maybe where you are on that curve. Um, we certainly want to stay in an optimal spot uh, where we're not too stressed. All right, so in our session today, we're really gonna focus on emotional agility, which is a concept developed by Susan David, who has a PhD. Um, what this process is, or what this concept is, is kind of an approach to handling your emotions. Um, certainly we feel a range of them throughout the day in varying levels of intensity and in varying levels of frequency. Um, but the goal is to kind of have acceptance with our emotions, an open mind, and kind of be clear about where those emotions are coming from and what they mean. Um, so I do wanna emphasize that in this process, we don't ignore our emotions. Um, we're not saying this is not toxic positivity. It's actually quite the opposite, um, but you're, you are facing your emotions. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides, but um, it's, it's a way to observe your emotions and not let them control your behavior. So what Susan David says is that our emotions are our critical messengers. Um, they tell us, you know, that something isn't quite right, um, that maybe we are moving away from our values or from the way we would like to live our lives or the way we would like to behave. Um, and that emotions are data. So when we feel an emotion like sadness or anger, um, if we ignore it or suppress it, um, we're, we're missing out on really important information that could be helpful to us. So we want to monitor that information and process that information so we can make the best decisions um, and act in our own best interest. Uh, she also talks about how we have these thoughts and emotions all day long, um, all these inner experiences, and she categorizes them into kind of three, three places. We have those thoughts that are often unpleasant. Uh, some of the examples there, I'm not good enough. I'm struggling with this. My boss is undermining me. Uh, we have emotions like anger and disappointment, or we have those stories that we tell ourselves that, you know, she always thinks this, or this always happens this way. And we kind of relive those stories over and over. Um, so when we have emotional agility, we know that we have these inner experiences. Many of them are unpleasant, um, but they don't predict our success or how effective we feel. Um, so we don't let them call the shots. We let what we truly value to, to guide us. Um, and we don't wanna do a disservice by shutting down or ignoring our emotions. So we're gonna bring them up. We're gonna bring them to light. We're gonna examine them. Uh, we're gonna observe them and then figure out what that data means. All right, so if those three types of 
um, ways of experiencing our emotions, those thoughts, uh, emotions, or stories, they're going to drive our behavior. So we, we have a stimulus, we have a response, and that's how we move through the world. Um, but when we're thinking about the trajectory of how we want to experience our life, we can have have two goals and want two goals. And Susan David talks about the have to goals are those kind of external expectations or, um, you know, we have this narrative, you know, my, my mother-in-law won't think I'm, you know, effective if my house isn't clean or someone's going to judge me or something like that. Um, we're typically trying to avoid shame. So those are those have to goals. We do it because we, we either have some story about it or some kind of expectation that we've placed. Um, but our want to goals, those are the goals that really reflect our values and our genuine interests. So those are the goals that we want to um, use to determine our behaviors. So when we focus on our want to goals, we're going to be drawn toward behaviors that help us achieve them um, because we're driven intrinsically. The have to goals become the, the should ofs, um, need tos, and if I don't, this is going to happen. So kind of thinking about that in terms of our place in the, in the professional world and in education, um, what are the, the want to goals that you may have? And what kinds of emotions may come up when you are in your classroom um, that point to those? So if something happens where you do feel slighted by a colleague or a leader, what is, what is that experience telling you? Or what is that emotion telling you? Maybe um, someone thought you dropped the ball on something and you get really um, frustrated right? That this person thinks I, I dropped the ball or, you know, maybe I did and I feel bad about it. What is that telling you about your values? Maybe it's telling you that, you know, hard work is important or that you, um, your care for students is kind of your, your first priority. Um, you kind of think through, okay, what is that telling me about my values and how can I design my goals to align with those values? So you can practice emotional agility. It's not just like resilience or grit or um, any of these other kind of self-motivating uh, concepts. It is not inherent. It is something you can practice and get better at. So there are a couple ways to, to do that. And you don't have to do all of them at once. Uh, but Susan David recommends kind of just showing up. So you're going to face your thoughts and emotions. Um, you're going to do it with curiosity, with kindness. Uh, we're not going to overemphasize positive thinking. Some emotions are very valid and appropriate um, for that moment. So some, some may be those kind of repeated thoughts that are stuck in your psyche. Um, but those emotions are part of who we are and we can learn to, to work with them and, and then move on. Um, another way to do it is to kind of step out or detach from and, and observe your thoughts and emotions and kind of remind yourself that that's all they are. They're just thoughts, they're just emotions. Um, you're kind of seeing yourself as being filled with possibilities rather than being stuck in one place. Um, how we react or what our response is, is not preordained and we have some choice. Um, so if we kind of create that open space that's non-judgmental, um, we can identify the feelings we're experiencing and find what feels to us the most appropriate way to react. Um, so those, those mental experiences aren't controlling us. We're, we're taking the time to to decide what that possibility is that we want to pursue. Uh, the next one, another way to practice is walking your why. So your core values, you know, what are they? What, what direction do they um, guide you toward? And these are 
it's the practice of taking action that aligns with those values. Um, so when you can recognize emotions, um, accept them, kind of distance yourself from them, whether they're painful or scary or disruptive, um, you can kind of integrate that reflection into your long-term values and aspirations. And then moving on. So cultivating mindsets, cultivating habits that are aligned with your values. Um, you want to be in a place where you have a balance between um, challenge and competence so that you're excited, you're enthusiastic, you're invigorated. Um, it's kind of the, the living your values. And emotional agility in the workplace, why, why might that be important? Um, certainly the ability to adapt um, and kind of adjust to changing circumstances, especially in the last few years has been hugely important. Um, organizations are only as agile as the people working within them. So kind of what happens when we're faced with these really tough challenges that have essentially changed the whole landscape. Um, we, when we're quick to react, we're gonna become transactional. We're gonna make quick decisions or rash decisions. We might shut down. We might be overwhelmed with stress or panic. Um, so when we have these complex situations, it becomes even more important for us to be clear-headed, to be collaborative, uh, to pause and kind of tolerate ambiguity, but sort of, you know, we got to explore it and see, um, see where we need to go and what, what is best going to help our students. So we, we need that emotional agility so that we are working together and seeking solutions and staying calm and focused and regulated. Um, and so we can, so we can move forward versus being controlled by, by the situation. So what is the connection between emotional agility and mindfulness? Uh, mindfulness is a window and a way to practice that emotional agility. So the, the four that we talked about, the walking your why and stepping out, moving on. Um, when you practice mindfulness, it gives you the opportunity to explicitly practice those things. Um, so when we engage in mindfulness, we're observing our inner world. We are um, seeing what, what thoughts, emotions, and stories are, are going through our brains. Um, and it's that first component, self-awareness, is the first component of emotional intelligence. So that overall helps us develop our emotional agility. Uh, mindfulness lets us experience and accept those powerful emotions with that curiosity and kindness. Um, so let's say we're really angry about something. When we engage in mindfulness, we can observe it. Uh, we get a little more focus. We get a little more clarity. And maybe we're discovering the source of that anger that is actually something else. Um, we got triggered by something, but the real source may be something, something we didn't realize at first until we slowed down to, to think about it. Uh, mindfulness can help us label our emotions accurately. So we might respond as anger or see that emotion as anger, but then as we sit with it and engage in that, that observing with curiosity, we realize it's actually something else and it might be sadness or fear or disappointment. Um, and the more accurate we can be with labeling our emotions, the more accurately we can plan the response um, and make that, that informed choice for how we how we react. Um, we talked a little bit about not suppressing our emotions and there's kind of two ways to do that. We can bottle them, which is I'm gonna pretend they're not there. I'm going to put them in this little bottle or this little box and I'm gonna put it over here and pretend it doesn't exist. Um, so that's one way to suppress your emotions. The other way is, is brooding, which is the kind of repeated um, replaying of the situation, um, kind of feeling that emotion over and over again, uh, but not moving 
toward resolution or moving toward um, our most constructive response, we sort of get stuck, right? Um, so we want to work through our emotions rather than bottling or brooding, um, because that is going to let them be just emotions uh, versus um, keeping them in a place that doesn't doesn't serve us, right? We're not listening to the data and we're not um, noticing and, and taking account of what, what we might need. All right, so we are gonna practice today. We're gonna do about a, a five minute or so mindfulness practice that helps us uh, build our emotional agility. Um, I just, I love this quote from Susan David. She said, life's beauty is inseparable from its fragility. So with that in mind, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and find a comfortable spot. And just let your body settle into your chair or into the floor. Go ahead and close your eyes. And place your hands wherever they're comfortable. If you are feeling more like you'd like to receive, you can place your palms up facing the sky. If you're feeling more of a need to ground and feel a foundation, you can place your palms downward toward the ground. And let's take just a few deep breaths on your own time. And just settle into this space. Breathing deep into the rib cage. Releasing. And on your next breath, deep into the belly. and releasing. I'd like for you to think of a recent situation that felt challenging or that created strong emotions. Maybe you snapped at someone you love Maybe you missed a deadline or an appointment. Maybe you felt some loss or remorse. Just draw up that challenging situation. Is that emotion coming back? What feelings did that situation cause? Might be I am sad, I am angry, I am disappointed or stressed. And just sit with that emotion.
I'd like for you to rephrase the feeling. So I notice I am feeling sad. I notice I am feeling angry. I notice I am feeling disappointed or stressed. Just repeat that in your mind one more time. I notice I am feeling sad, angry, disappointed. And I'd like you to think about if someone you loved was feeling that way and said to you, I notice I am feeling blank, what would you say? How would you show them compassion? You extend that compassion to yourself. If it feels right to you, take another deep breath. And as you're extending that compassion to yourself, just notice whether there are more layers to this emotion. Is there anything underneath? Whatever that core emotion is, whether it was the original or you found another one underneath, go ahead and look at it with curiosity. If that emotion were a signpost toward your values, what is it telling you that you care about? You can ask yourself, what is this emotion trying to tell me is important to me right now? Take a few moments to notice whatever else comes along. Take a deep breath to expand the rib cage. Side to side and front to back. Maybe pause at that deepest hold. 
and then release. Let's do that one more time, deep into the rib cage, expanding all the way around. Deep hold and release. And when you're ready, come back into the room. Great, thank you. So in that practice, we uh, used three things to practice emotional agility. We used acceptance, which is the, I notice I am feeling versus I am. So rather than identifying with the emotion, we are observing it. We did, we practiced compassion. So thinking about how we might comfort someone we love who was experiencing the same thing um, and how we might extend that to ourselves or, or what, is, what is underneath this that needs attention. And we also practiced curiosity. So what values are, are, are coming to light? Uh, what is important to me right now? So you don't have to practice all three of these each time. You can pick one to practice. So, um, you know, when you find yourself reacting emotionally or reacting to a situation, you can notice your emotions. So you are the sky watching the clouds of emotions drift by. You can extend some compassion to yourself and or you can look at the emotion with curiosity um, and what they're trying to tell you about what you value. So you don't have to do all three. You can pick one. Um, and practicing that over and over and pausing for that moment of mindfulness will, will really help build your emotional agility. Um, this is also something you can use with students. I think particularly, you know, when a, maybe you're having a one-on-one -on -one with a student who's having a situation, you know, asking them, what are you feeling? Asking them, how can, that's the acceptance, right? How can I be of help, the compassion, and what might you need right now? What, what values are they experiencing um, that need some attention? Uh, if you'd like to kind of explore your own emotional agility, there is a self-assessment quiz um, at susandavid.com slash learn. And that will just kind of give you a sense of, of where you are in your emotional agility and, and where you might like to spend some time um, developing your skills. So just with this closing quote, our emotions are data, slow down and face into your difficult emotions with courage. What you find there will signpost to you how you can make better decisions and take values-based actions. Um, Susan David's book is called Emotional Agility, so I highly recommend it. Um, but if I can be of help at all, or you have any questions, please feel free to reach me at julie.stephanlindsay at canyonsdistrict.org and just some important links to uh, remind you about. So thank you so much for joining this Bite Size PD. Have a wonderful day and please take care of yourselves.